Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? Let's do it. We have not only a little bit more Riley Leonard in rapid fire, we'll have some Steve Angeli comments coming up here as well. A little peanut butter and jelly time after practice today. So we've been talking about Riley Leonard. The blue gold game is a week from Saturday, about a week and a half away from right now. Will Riley Leonard be playing in it? Um, I don't know. I feel like if the blue and gold game was like a real game, yeah. like in the season, it would be like a 50-50 call. Yeah. However, because it's like the blue and gold game, I don't know if we're going to get to that point. Okay, Jess, scale of 1 to 10, what chance do you give him to play in the blue gold game? Zero out of 10. <laughs> um, I think it's hilarious, though, that he literally would not say, I'm not playing. Like, right. he, was, he just would not um, give it up. Like, I mean, uh, and that pause to me was like, I really want to, but yeah, now exactly. they're going to let me. But they're know? not going to let me. Like, yeah. I would love to do it out there. But it was so funny because, like, again, he was like, eh, like, and then he was like, well, if the Blue Bowl <laughs> game was, you know, week one. Yeah. I would probably be out there, you know, if push came to shove. But since this is only, you know, the spring game, yeah, I'd say it's like a 50-50 chance. Like, no, dude, there's no way you are playing. And That's I just right. – it, it just it, – it, it feeds back into everything we've talked about. Like, he just – he can't really take it. Like, he wants to be out there. He is just so itching to be out there. But I guess, the like, that's what I would want. Like, I wouldn't want my quarterback being like, oh, yeah, I'm hurt. So, I guess I could just take the rest of, you know, like – that's the good part that's coming out of this is you want yes. a quarterback like this. I love the fact that he that he is so obviously enthusiastic about everything, about right. wanting to play, about competing, about you know wanting to be with his teammates more and bond with his teammates more, about playing in Mike Denbrock's offense and the fact that he thinks you know that he can light up the scoreboard in this offense and the whole thing. That's all awesome, but I don't want to see it in April. <laughs> I want to see it in August. Like you know that they've told him that he's April not like, playing. Put him in hibernation. Yes. For another month. You know? You you know that they have told him he's not playing, but he doesn't want to be the guy to say, I'm not he will playing. Not, he will not admit it. That's yes. right. <laughs> <laughs> he is not going to go that far. Commitment he's not willing to make. Okay, so a guy who we are going to see in the blue gold game, Steve Angeli. And here he is discussing what helped to take him to the next level. This past season, definitely say Coach Cordulli coming in and you know furthering my development. And you know I, I say it every time that I'm able to say it. Sam Harvin played a big role, um, kind of being under his wing for a year, developing that relationship with him. He taught me a lot. Like I said before, he's played a lot of ball. So asking him all those questions, getting to know him on a personal level and how he carries himself on and especially off the field, his process definitely helped me. And just kind of learning those little secrets all went into the preparation that I kind of took the mindset every day of practice. Like I'm preparing like the starter for the. So when my time came, it wasn't any different. By the way, Jess, you see that that Angeli photo that I was using there? Do you see, do you see a little bit of that Joe Burrow I was talking about? I do see some of the Joe Burrow you were yeah. talking about. I know. I know. Okay. So you hear him giving all that credit to Sam Hartman. So where do you rank that when you apply it to the overall impact that you really want someone like Riley Leonard and what he needs to have this year in terms of, okay, you brought this guy in it, it, you know, like it, it goes beyond, I think just what he does on the field. Doesn't it? When you bring a guy like that in. Yeah. And, and I, I guess before we get a hundred percent of that, I think it was really cool. They led with Gino Gadelli or Gadulli as Gadulli. well, because yeah. that is something that we've talked about consistently of, you know, D Notre Dame developing quarterbacks. And so, we always, you know, talked about, hey, they need this role. They need someone to actually be dedicated to this. And so to hear an actual player say, yeah, like that, having someone like that is really good. And so you know that that's, that's not just Steve Angeli. Like that's across the whole quarterback room. But to get back into your original question, I do think that that's part of the whole package or part of the whole equation when you bring in something like Riley Learn. Like, of course, you are – the expectation is to be QB1, but it's also to be a mentor at the same time. Like that is the part of being a really good player at times is also mentoring the young players. Do you really care about the development of, you know, everyone else around you? Or are you ultimately just in it for yourself? Because as long as Ryan Leonard is healthy, he is going to be the starting quarterback in every single game this season. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what can you do to better the program for when you leave and show kind of your gratefulness for the opportunity? Right. And so it, it, you hope that you get fortunate on having a guy with the mindset like that. Like there are some guys who transfer in and it's, it's about themselves and the NIL money, right? Like 
but you hope to be, you know, again, the, the total package of not only is he here to be the starting quarterback, but he's here to make everyone else around him better as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think that, you know, again, when you, when you look at the personality of a Sam Hartman that, who they brought in, when you look at the personality of Riley Leonard, and you can even say it, I think about Jack Cohn going back to the third transfer quarterback. Those are the kind of personalities that they have. And I don't think that they would bring him in if they didn't think that that was going to be part of the deal. But I, yeah, I do. I mean, I think that that, that weighs high, that you're not just going to have a guy who comes in and it's all about himself. I think that this needs to be part of the deal. Like that quarterback room, those guys are so tight. And obviously, you know, there, there can be only one, right? Like, cause like you said, unless you're know, barring injury, Riley Leonard's going to start all the games next year, but he's also got to be able to help those other guys because of the experience that they lack, help them get ready so that when he's gone, they can, they can ultimately one day be the guy. Gordian Knott says he loves all, almost all breeds, but probably will never own anything with even a dash of Chihuahua. What do you say about that, Jess? I just, I had to pull up these comments, you know, growing up, I never thought I would be a small dog person, but here I am with two dogs under 10 pounds, basically. Right. And so I would say, don't hate it until you try it. I love my small dogs. You've been around them. They're not as bad as what you would think. They're really I will say this. And they're pretty loving and, and they're pretty like entertaining to, to watch. Especially. Henry's part Chihuahua. Scooby is full Chihuahua, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Henry is much more chill. I think <laughs> than the full Chihuahua. <laughs> well, also he still realize, yaps a little bit, but a yeah, lot of but the, yapping, the, the full you know. Chihuahua is like half the age too. He's still a little little puppy, so he's That's you know he's he's growing into his young and little spry behavior. Yeah, but what I was getting at is, I think you probably like when you first saw that those dogs were coming over, you're like, oh my goodness, but like they're not as they're not as crazy or rabid as what you think, and they're pretty. Most They're pretty the entertaining. Yeah, they can be annoying, but I mean, any dog can be annoying. Right. <laughs> okay, so Steve Angeli also discussed where he's made the most physical improvement since last season. I think uh, overall, just like my feet and footwork, um, I think I've been able to move faster throughout my reads, you know, being uh, having a lot more strength, developing more strength from Coach Landau, especially in the weight room. Has helped me get you know more velocity on the ball, being able to push up in the pocket, make more plays with my legs. So overall, just athleticism with him, and just overall feeling better. And then when your feet are right, are you more accurate? Hundred percent. Yeah, it I think that. Sense. Yeah, it always goes like that. You know, when you miss a throw, you're like, man, my feet were messed up. My base wasn't good. So having a strong base and good feet, you know, definitely set you up for success. And when it comes to making corrections. <laughs> <laughs> what TD four in D San Angeli is half Chihuahua man. I don't know about that. Come on. Do you think correcting the footwork is is easier than when you get into you know arm slots and all that different kind of stuff? I do because like Patrick Mahomes makes all the arm slot stuff look crazy. Like not everyone can throw the ball like that. At all, all he throws in different slots, slots without right. even having to think about it. Basically. What I would say is like, I, I'm going to equate this to playing baseball, I think, because I, I was never a person who had like a really good consistent throwing motion. Like I found a way to get the ball across the diamond. Right. But like, right. I didn't have comparatively, I didn't have tremendous arm strength. Right. I can say that, but I felt like the things that really helped me was establishing good footwork, gaining ground towards first base as I'm fielding the ball, just like little things that can kind of, because I felt like the, the throwing motion thing is like uh, guys who throw really well are guys who are probably consistently throwing the same way for 10, 15 years. Right. And so that becomes muscle memory, like things that you do for, you know, however many hours, 2000, 4,000 hours, like, or, or repetitions, like that becomes muscle memory. Right. So like, I think at a certain point, you've really kind of maxed out what your arm slot is to a degree, right? And so the way I start looking at it again is how can I do things to provide power or extra zip to how I'm already throwing the ball? And so when you when you think about Steve Angeli, I think if he can focus on, okay, how do I get my footwork into, you know, like a power triangle, right? Like where am I, where am I most balanced in my hips where I can really get, you know, get into the ball and make more accurate passes? Again, that's kind of how I think about it, is what mechanics can he do to get the ball across the diamond or the field just a little bit better, knowing, that, again, that his arm slot 
and arm motion is what it is. Like you're not going to tweak those things, right? You know, middle of spring, middle of season, maybe a little bit in the off season, but like again, it primarily is what it is. So what can you do with footwork? What can you do with you know your eyes, like the other stuff to to kind of make the other part better? Right. As long as you have a repeatable motion with the arm, but you're you're seeing the inaccuracies, you look at the feet because the throwing starts with the feet, where your stride is, you know, how you're all those things that you're talking about, turning your hips, all these different things, whether you're throwing a football or a baseball, it starts with your feet. It's and I, I think that, you know, having, you know, went went through some of the stuff that you're talking about, I think it is much easier to work on correcting the feet than when you start getting into the arm slots like you're talking about. Because like you go back to a guy like Brandon Wimbush, who, you know, all of a sudden started like yips and, you know, couldn't complete a, a short pass. And it was all, you know, like, OK, can we correct this? And, you know, he's working with the throwing coach and doing all these different things. It is just so hard, especially once you get into the season because of the muscle memory stuff that you talked about to, you know, to, well, it's the last to thing try you to think change about. that kind You don't of want thing. to be yeah. thinking about your throwing you don't mechanics. Want, yeah, and that's it. You, not only do you not want to, you can't think about it as right. well. Because once you you're so thinking many about other things that, going on, you lose. Yeah, that's right. You, If you're thinking about where your arm slot needs to be, then you're going to lose, you know, reading a safety or reading a linebacker or whatever right. it happens to be. Like, and, and that just means you're going to get – like, honestly, the more you think, the more likely they are that you're going to get hurt or it's going to be a bad play. Like, I'm just being 100% honest. Like, when you have other things outside factors that you are supposed to, at that point, have kind of mastered or down, like stuff that you should no longer be thinking about, like, it's only just going to set you back. Um, right. Small tidbit here. I was listening to the Cubs game the other day. Dansby Swanson doesn't swing a bat or take ground balls, like, the entire offseason. Really? I, he, he basically said, you know, like I, I, during the season or like once spring training comes and every, like he really ramps it up in the off season. He just, he enjoys that time off of just kind of not overdoing it. Right. Like not over pressing, being able to walk away, come back, refresh. I just, I thought it was interesting to hear. Like I've never heard someone kind of take that approach before. And then I was listening, I guess Nico Horner does a lot of like now VR swings. So instead of hitting off the tee, he'll put on like the VR goggles and take like dry swings doing that. Just things to take, you know, the load or the pressure off the body during the off season. I just thought that was really cool because it kind of goes into, I thought a little bit what we were talking about with Angeli there. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Rabid Nile Chihuahua going back to the <laughs> dog conversation. He says, Angeli strikes him more as a lab. That's kind of what I was thinking as well. Yeah. Much more lab than, than yapper dog. So DK brings a, a very good point here. The, that, that saga was, uh, got way the, too deep. <laughs> way DK too got deep. way too deep in Wimbush's head. This is true. <laughs> yep. Very unfortunate. And that can happen too, you know, because once you start, once you start thinking about, cause I, I remember, you know, again, I don't want to make this all about you and your baseball and stuff like that, but we're talking about mechanical stuff. Like when you were young, you threw a little bit odd, but then this coach at a, you know, what was supposed to be, you know, what everyone thinks is like the best little league in town corrected it. And it only ultimately made it worse in the long run. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then it was like trying to correct some of that stuff. And that's, that can happen too. You, you know, you start getting multiple voices and like this guy thinks, you know, he's got the answer. This guy, I think at some point you answer. just kind of have to stick to what your body naturally is telling you. Cause like, I like you watch and I get it. These are professional baseball players, but watch some of these MLB guys. Like not everyone throws orthodox across the diamond, right? Like how right. you would teach, you know, from the start to fit like, and I think that was kind of like, that's what so many people get caught up in is we all don't have to throw the same way. We all don't have well, to have, the same mechanics there's still natural fluidity whether you're throwing a football whether you're throwing a baseball that your body when you start growing up has told you like this is what you're going to do to get the most power or yeah. you know, like what kind of fits your body right because we're not all the same yeah do you remember brett Lilly who played notre dame baseball yeah, center fielder hit by pitch every game well he wasn't a center fielder he was started off as a middle infielder but at least for one year the member they moved him over to third base yeah and when he was playing middle infield he was just like a regular over-the-top thrower, but when he went over to third base, 
you know, I think because the throw is a little bit longer. Get and that was, ball out. Remember, he started throwing it sidearm yes. over there. You know, and again, it's just about what gets it done, you know. <laughs> and that's kind of where I got as to the point. it gets there. The, yeah. You know, my, like I just had to do what, what would get the job done. Yep. All right. So Iowa women's basketball is going to hold a celebration Wednesday night to celebrate their basketball team finishing as national runner up. Caitlin Clark and the team are going to be there to be recognized. So Brianna Turner, who was a two time runner up when she was here at Notre Dame with Muffet McGraw, tweeted, Respectfully, I'm confused. Is this what the runner up typically does now? Haven't seen this before, but kudos to them for publicly honoring all that they've accomplished this season. So do you buy or sell Iowa celebrating its runner-up finish in the way that they're going to do? They're going to fill Carver Hawkeye. <laughs> I sell it as a, <laughs> a runner-up celebration. I buy it as a Caitlin Clark celebration and everything else that it has allowed this team, this community, this fan base to accomplish in the ride that they've been on the last two seasons. I don't think you promote it. But that's the hard part is you can't promote it as just one player because it's still a team sport. Right. And so you're kind of stuck of, well, we can't call it a Clay- Caitlin Clark cel- or celebration, but also it probably doesn't sound great to call it a run runner up celebration. Right. So, like, I get it. And that's what I think this is. I think more than anything, this is your last chance to celebrate arguably the biggest. I mean, you can argue, you know, she's one of the again, we tried to retire the goat conversation. She is one of the best. <laughs> women's basketball players ever. And I think more than anything, they're celebrating the fact her career is done and they want, they want one last chance to kind of the bow honor her. Yeah. Like put a bow on top, still honor a great season back to back national runner up finishes. But like you said, you can't just say, well, this is all about Caitlin Clark. So it's, you know, celebration to honor the team because it was still a great season. Yeah, you know, Rabbit Nile, you're right. I can't imagine Michael Jordan celebrating coming in second. You're right. They don't do parades, you know, for for finishing second. But at the same time, it's not an issue that Michael Jordan or the Bulls had to deal with once he <laughs> hit his prime. They were always winning, you know, as long as he was in a Bulls uniform. But I think, you know, again, I think that you literally have the biggest star, maybe the biggest star in, in women's college basketball history and i think it is as much about sort of one last hurrah yeah for caitlin clark that's as it is for anything. yeah people are gonna be crying like it's gonna be emotional you know like the the people who would like again like sports go beyond so much of the player like think of all the, the people that caitlin clark has potentially touched or given inspiration to or yeah. you know some of that stuff that again goes more unnoticed outside of the stat box yeah and i mean td 4nd <laughs> Great point as well. Last time they'll celebrate for a while. I mean, literally, unless all of a sudden, because, you know, again, it was Caitlin Clark and, you know, four pretty good college basketball players, but none of them were close to the caliber of Caitlin Clark. So unless Lisa Bluter all of a sudden, you know, like, unless this gives her recruiting a serious uptick, then I think that, uh, you know, this is going to be the last chance that Iowa women's basketball has a chance to celebrate anything for a long time. DK is DK is already, he's like off the clock. Okay. The season's over. We can stop talking about (laughs) women's basketball. Now he's just been sitting here, you know, all season, just putting up with, with the women's basketball talk, even though record record audiences, speaking of which fill in the blank, it's blank that for the first time ever, the women's basketball championship game had better viewership than the men's championship game after Iowa South Carolina drew about four million more viewers than last night's UConn Purdue men's game. It's great. It's fantastic. I mean, it goes back to exactly why I believe Caitlin Clark and Iowa deserve that celebration. Is just look at what she did. You know, her impacts for Iowa, her impacts on on college women's basketball, and furthermore, like I was listening, like it's, and I guess. I think the better word is actually it's it's no surprise. I'm gonna I'm gonna amend my answer. It's no surprise because you know watching the women's game compared to the men's game, and then today it really hit home. I was I was I was listening to this podcast where of these two guys who play for the Knicks together. I think I brought this up or talked to you about it before. They said that they preferred 
to watch the women's game than the men's right now just because the quality is better, their play is better, and they quite literally said they didn't they haven't watched it a second of the men's tournament because they think that the men's game isn't nearly as good as where the women's is. And so I'm going to say it's no surprise for that reason. I felt like the women's tournament put out better quality, better product. Really the only reason why we love the men's tournament is because of upsets, right? Like upsets that's the and brackets. That's like, that's the brackets. That's really yeah. if you want to look at actual quality of play over the last 10 years, there's no surprise that the women's game has slowly kind of made this uphill gain on the men's game on the men's game and now surpassed them. Yeah, a lot of great points and you're exactly right. I said going into the tournament when we talked about interest in the women's game compared to the men's, the women's game has had like the biggest star and they had a handful of other stars as well. And they obviously had a great team <coughs> to go along with it in South Carolina who capped the whole thing off with a perfect season. As Johnny Action says, it's a pure form of the sport and that's a fact. And, you know, look, it's still like 18 and a half million viewers. So is everybody watching women's college basketball? No, but more people are watching it now than ever. And, you know, I had always you know, for a long time, just kind of taken the stance of you're either a women's basketball fan or you're not. But that was really disproved this year. And it really started last year as well with the fact that they set that record in the championship game. But each of the last three games Caitlin Clark played in, they set a new viewership record. And the women's game had the biggest star in the game. And when you, you know, when you look at that comment about a pure form, fundamentally, I think the women's game has become better than the men's college game right now. Obviously, you don't have the dunks and stuff like that. And, you know, like people who are really into the men's game, you know, like would much rather see, you know, the, you know, the dunks than all the layups and three point shots and stuff like that. But um, it just... It's it's just a more fundamental game because of the fact that the women still have the players staying together for four years and the men don't. I think it's I think that that by and large is why the men's game has become a little bit to me even harder to watch because you don't have players staying together and the fact that you have players staying for four years in college basketball. I mean that's how Caitlin Clark became the star in this meteor that she became because of last year's national championship and just swooped it all through this season. James says four quarters in women's basketball is pathetic. I completely disagree with that. Remember men's college basketball is the only level yeah. of basketball that only plays halves. That's not playing quarters and everybody brutal. else, everybody else is playing quarters. I think game flow is tons better in the women's game than it is in the men's game because of the quarters. I love the quarters and I didn't think that I wasn't really sure how I would feel when they changed it over and doing games and stuff like that I love quarters compared to halves we take it any day of the week and the other you know part of this Joe says they need to change the time of the men's game and D-Hawk 942 tip off for a championship it is ridiculous the latest they should be and I know they want to get the west coast viewership and all that stuff they really like the latest they should be tipping off is nine o'clock there's no reason tipping off that much after nine o'clock on a Monday night. I think you get away with eight 15. I think so too, or at least eight 30, even eight 45 would help out quite a bit. Cause like eight 45 is five 45 right. on the West coast. Like still in the happy hour area. John went to bed at halftime. That is half of the game longer than I made it. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> did not last. Okay. Now, Ian Eagle, the lead play-by-play -play announcer for the Final Four, after Jim Nance stepped aside from that role last year, what did you think of, of Ian Eagle as the lead play-by-play -play man for CBS and in the Men's March Madness this season? Yeah, so I have to <clears throat> I have to say I based this off of really some of the games I caught him in in the earlier rounds and around the Final Four because I didn't watch the championship, you know. So, But I felt like <clears throat> in the games I did watch, um, it didn't felt like – it was missing a beat, right? Or that I like was like, oh man, I really want, really wish I had Jim Nance instead of I Ian Eagle. I love Ian Eagle, you know, outside of basketball. I like the work he does um, for football. I think he has a really good voice. And so 
I thought that he stepped up, stepped into the role very seamlessly, and you, the, the transition was unnoticeable, which is exactly with what you kind of want when you're replacing someone like Jim Nance. Yeah. I think that he's really good with Raft because they've done a lot of NBA games together in yeah. the past. They've got they a know lot each of natural other. chemistry. He knows when to yeah. let Raft do his thing. Right. They're the only one, you know, and again, this is just like play-by-play -play guy, you know, one – annoyance with Ian Eagle because I do think he's really good. I don't think I, I'm not, I'm not as in on Ian Eagle as like the East coast guys, because that's where he, you know, works NBA and all that. The one thing that annoys me is that when a guy shoots a three pointer, he doesn't say three pointer or, you know, takes a th three, whatever. He always calls it a jumper or a jump shot. And I realize technically it is a jump shot because you're, you know, jump shot form and all that stuff. But to me, a three is a three. You've got to say three. And he always yeah. calls it jumper. And that's the only thing that annoys me. You Especially, you have to, yeah, distinguish between, like, I get yeah. it on TV, but I don't know. You've got to let people know that it's a three-pointer. Yeah. You know? Like, what if his foot's on the line? You don't know. Right. Johnny Action says he finds it amazing how a freshman player from USC, and he's of course he's talking about Juju Watkins, was promoted by Disney ESPN, but one from Notre Dame was a first team All American, was not. And I just, I don't feel like, like I heard a lot about Juju Watkins this year, and maybe it's just because she's in Los Angeles and you've got that market, market and all that stuff. Like I didn't. I heard a lot about her, but it you plays you just, at the same school nationally. As like, yeah, Bonnie like James. if there was a game on, the ESPN people would always rave about Hannah Hidalgo, you know, like during the game and stuff like that. But outside of the games, I didn't hear nearly as like, much Hidalgo hype. I feel like when Juju Watkins blew up for whatever that game was in the beginning of the season, what was it, like 50, 60 points or something? Like, yeah, that's and then she got all kinds of, you know, pub publicity. She's in the LA market. You know what I mean? It just felt like that is what put her over the top. She had that, like if Hannah Hidalgo dropped 60 as a, you know, a five foot, whatever guard, like I think that puts her on the map a little bit more. Right. Love to see a head to head matchup. That would be fun. That'd be fun. Like an early game next season. Yeah. They used to play. They used to play at the start of the season um, quite a bit, like back in the early 2000s. And then that series kind of went away, but USC women weren't quite as good as um, as Notre Dame back then. But now, I mean, they're they're both going to be top ten going into that next season. That would be a lot of fun to see Notre Dame and USC and Hidalgo and Watkins in a head to head. Well, the thing that would be cool about it is, you know, if you did a game in LA, tons of Notre Dame people would show up, right? You know, just because of the football, the long standing football rivalry that's already there. Yep, I agree. I agree. Everyone, everyone upset at the lack of Hidalgo coverage. All right. So there's been a rash of starting pitchers already getting injured at the More start today. of Major League Baseball season. Yeah, I saw that. Even another one today. So there's some people who are blaming the pitch clock for this phenomena, I guess. Rash of injuries, whatever you want to call it. Do you buy or sell the pitch clock as the culprit? Um... I listened to a really good interview with Justin Verlander, and this is kind of what stemmed me to start thinking about it. And what Verlander got into is, you know, back in 2016, they started tweaking with the ball a little bit, right? Like basically the ball started flying a little bit more. And so he was basically alluding to, you know, pitches that you would just try to get weak contact from are now kind of flying out of the ballpark. And so as a pitcher, naturally – you start, you know, tweaking with stuff because you can no longer pitch in those areas and expect that kind of contact, right? Mm -hmm. And he went on to say, you know, like, I'm not blaming the ball. We're all playing with the same ball. So at the end of the day, like, it's it's equally competitive, right? But I would sell it in terms of it being the primary cause. I think it's more of a, a cocktail of reasons. I think, you know, the, the recent phenomenon with analytics plays a, uh, you know, a part in it. Just all these different, you know, like the driveline, how all these guys in the offseason go and you know, they're hooked up to all these sensors and they're, you know, everything is analyzed, right? They're I think looking that, for the perfect arm slot to throw a hundred miles an hour. And that basically. leads into my next thing is it's no longer cool to throw 90, 91, 92. Everyone's got to throw a yeah. hundred miles per hour. Right. Yes. And so if you're naturally throwing 90, 91, 92, 
what makes you think artificially throwing, you know, 100 miles per hour is ultimately, you know, good for your arm? And then you start throwing in, you know, spin now. Guys are spinning the ball a lot more. And you know what's something I thought about too is, and again, this is maybe, maybe you'll, you'll, I'd like your input here too. I mean, guys can't use quite as much sticky stuff anymore, right? Like they really have to, yeah. there's no more artificial spinning the ball. Like these guys have to create their it's own. all got to come from their torque. So That's I think right. that plays into it as well. Um, and then I do think the pitch clock, when you add in, you know, everything else I just talked about, guys kind of throwing unnaturally, trying to get up to hundred miles per hour. Guys trying to spin the ball more than ever. Now you have a shorter amount of time when you're trying to spin the ball and throw the ball as hard as you can. Like it's just, it's all kind of, I think, amassing into this one big problem. And so I don't think it's just the pitch clock, but the pitch clock has a, a, a role in it at the end of the day. When Nolan Ryan used to hit 100 miles an hour on the radar gun back in the 70s and 80s, it was like, oh, 100 miles an hour. You know, like there were very few guys who could top 100 miles an hour on the gun. And it was, you know, so it was a rarity. But now the the rarity is guys who can't hit 100 miles an hour because that's all these guys are doing being brought up. And there's the fixation with that velocity and the spin rates and just everything else that you're talking about. I think that that is the biggest thing. Could the pitch clock factor in there to some extent? Maybe because of the fact that you're throwing, you know, pitches in a, in a, you know, the, the, in a quicker succession than you would if you had a little bit more time, but you still got to throw a pitch. A pitch is a pitch, whether you're throwing it 20 seconds apart or 45 seconds right. apart. So you're I don't still think getting has... rest time in between yeah. games. And, you know, guys now pitch counts are way less than they used to be. So, like, even though you might be throwing them a little bit, you know, faster, overall, you're not throwing as many pitches as a starting pitcher anymore. So I really don't understand. That argument. Well, that's the thing too. Is guys are coming out. Starting pitchers are ba- are almost used just like a long term reliever anymore. You know, like it used to be, you would look, you know, when they would post the games and who the starting pitchers were that day, you would base a great deal of your decision if you're trying to say who's going to win this game. You know, like you were basing a great deal of your decision on who the starting. They were going to pitch eighty five percent of the game. Yeah, but now Maybe even hundred. But now they get through the fifth inning, and that's pretty much it. You know, so like they might be showing or, or throwing pitches in quicker succession, but overall, they're not throwing any more pitches over the entirety of a season than they used to pitch. So I just I don't think that you can blame the clock for that. You know, I I think it is much more. About, you know, like you've got, again, you've got the fixation on velocity combined with, you know, the torque that you're talking about. And then like these relievers as well, like you look at the Royals bullpen when, when they made their two world series runs and then, and that's kind of, I'm not putting it all on them or, or, you know, even crediting them with, that was really when this go to the bullpen quicker really started to come into fashion. The Royals shortened the game by the fact that they had three guys who seven, could eight, all be nine. closers and they bring them in in succession, seven, eight, nine. That's right. They, you know, they had their, uh, they had their roles and it was like, boom, 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 but they were pitching quite a bit. They were, you know, like anytime the Royals had the lead, they were going to those guys. I think D-Hawk brings a great point up here. Maddox never threw harder than 88 and was the best pitcher in the game. It's eager. Ego. Batter doesn't flinch at 100 miles per hour. And it's like every batter can hit 100 these days. It doesn't matter. Like everyone's got the bat speed to hit 100 miles per hour. It's all about stuff. And I was telling you this yesterday. Like look at Kyle Hendricks for the Cubs. He's never thrown over 90 miles per hour. He has a wicked changeup. And he's never – like he's pitched in the MLB for like – 10 straight years and never had an elbow issue. He just sticks to what he's good at, hitting locations, getting enough movement off of his fastball. And I think what you have to look at as pitchers, the big thing is your deceptiveness. Like your fastball and and changeup should look the exact same until the last second and then it splits off. Like that's what the good pitchers are good at is deceiving their pitches. Like that is Kyle Hendricks right there. Like you think you're getting a fastball at 88 and then all of a sudden, you know, it runs six inches off the plate and it's a changeup. Everything comes out of the same arm slot, but it's three different pitches that are going to do three different things. That's right. All right. <laughs> DK said, is baseball better to watch or talk about? I mean, 
lately probably talking about. But Jesse is Jesse is already in big time on the Cubs. Are you going to have your heart broken again? Are they going to blow another lead? Um, Central's going to be tough this season. I think the Central might get – you might see three teams come out of the Central – this season, I think the Cubs are good. The Reds are good. And then I think the the Pirates finally have some starting pitching to kind of match some of that talent that they have. And when they call, call up, call up, uh, what's his name? Skinnies, Skeens. Skeens. They're going to be tough. You know, they're going to have really good. I saw again, I think, I think the central for being kind of mediocre or bad the last, you know, five years or so, I think you're going to see a, a, a much improved. Like, I think every team is going to be above 500 in the Central this season. I think you're going to see three teams come out of that division. <laughs> Not in the AL Central, though. <laughs> <laughs> yep, John. John up on, on the see? Buccos. Pirates in first place right now. Yep. Well, they did this last year. That's the thing. They started hot. Can they just continue it? We'll see. Yep. That's what's fun about baseball. You get 162 games, baby. Like, there's... There's no like anomaly when you play 162 games. You know what I mean? Like it's everything is naturally going to, you know, regulate itself. While the Cubs probably shouldn't have lost last night, the way I look at it is they're probably going to win a game at some point this season that they didn't deserve to win. So it'll all balance out. I've got to get into baseball mode. I've got my baseball package <laughs> on the TV. I've got to start getting in there. You were talking though. You're not a big, you know, baseball doesn't feel baseball until like May for you. I feel like it's yeah. definitely not March. And I feel for like sure. April's kind of knocking on the door a little bit. But once you get into like yeah. the beginning of May, that's like, that's baseball season. Yeah. People don't realize how much you enjoy baseball. I do love baseball. That's what I mean. It's just, you know, like, especially for this show, the. Like, <laughs> it's not the high end of the totem pole. Have you seen much of Logan Webb? I don't think I've seen much of Logan Webb. Have you seen much of him? Giants, Giants pitcher Brent's asking. Uh, I've I bet on him at some point this season, but I don't know if I <laughs> I can't remember if I've actually sat down and watched him. I'll have to keep my eye out for him, and I'll give you some thoughts the next time I see him. Do the Cubs play the Giants anytime soon? Uh, they I guess the good part about that. that is it doesn't matter. I can just, I've got my package. I will, <laughs> You'll I find will uh, I'll make a point to find out when Logan Webb pitches next. And I will, uh, <laughs> I will see that if I can, uh, can give you some thoughts on him. We went to, um, what is that place called? Um, is it AT&T? What, what do they call the, the ballpark out there? Oh, in San Francisco. Um, I can't even think of it off the top of my head right oh, now. Oh, I, I I should know it. Um, I can see it over in left field. Yeah. Um, Oracle Park. It's Oracle now. Yeah. I've actually been to Candlestick before back in the day when I lived out there in Monterey for a year. We went to Candlestick a few different times and uh, saw the Giants play. We actually saw them play Barry Bonds and the Pirates once before, you know, Barry Bonds went to San Francisco and we also saw him play. It was kind of the tail end. It was the, it was 88. So it was the year the Mets lost to the Dodgers in the NLCS. We saw, we saw the Mets play out there. I think David Cohn started the game that uh, at, at the old stick in the game that we went to always freezing at candlestick park out there, that wind coming off the bay. I like when we went to that Giants game, what was probably, I want to say. About 10 years ago now, right? Yeah, I was going to say seven or eight years ago. Um, but one of my favorite features about that ballpark is the usher. If you, I don't know about, I can't speak for the rest of the stadium, but in the lower bowl, the ushers did not let you walk down while action was going on in the game. Right. You had to wait in between innings or, you know, there had to be a stoppage in the game. I love that. I wish every freaking stadium, arena, ballpark could implement that. I know it's harder because of, you know, different pace of games and everything. But, you know, it's just people are paying a good price to be there. And the last thing you want is, the, you know, the, the jabroni in your aisle who's got five kids and he's up, <laughs> no, and, I down, agree. That's up like... and down in front of you. And yep. you got to get up every time. And now you're blocking people behind you. You know, and they got to get out of the aisle. That's usually I always buy aisle seats these days. So, like, when someone gets out, I just take one step. I get out there in the aisle, you know, everyone leaves, but I just hate that stuff. Cause I'm paying to be there. You know, I'm not paying for you to be standing up and trotting your family across me the entire time. Right. Have the courtesy, do it between innings jabronis. That's right. <laughs> Don't be a jabroni. All right. We will end it with that. Glad to have you here as always. 
<laughs> Decaf wants you to stop talking about. I know Vince, Vince is that guy. I know Vince you know is that is. guy. Vince don't care. Vince don't care about nothing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll we'll uh, we'll end it with that. Hit the like button if you would, and of course, subscribe, rate, review, and play your podcast. We will uh, talk to you tomorrow on Ivy Nation Sports Talk. Thanks, Joe.